okay. start the recording. Yep. All right. So why ask us to come and do a little uh, presentation on it? Kind of see if it can handle on what what we're building. We're over in the Geomatic and Geographic Research Center. So this is a uh, research center on campus um, connected with the geography part. But uh, uh, I do our own thing uh, with uh, mostly graduate students. But I understand the point. There's some interest here. And, starting to connect undergrads up with some of the work that we're doing as well. Um, so just run through this quickly. So the center is really focused on, on um, um, taking what's been worked on sort of field geomatics uh, uh, and uh, geographical information systems and applying it to uh, issues of interest to, uh, to, to people more in the social sciences and humanities. <coughs> Uh, this is the gang, uh, not all the gang, but some of us. Um, and um, the topics that, the, that we try to uh, tackle are um, looking at sort of these different ways of knowing uh, and using uh, what we know about organizing information, organizing data, and uh, presenting the visualization, the visualization and in particular uh, mapping, and I, I use that term easily, um, to uh, apply it to uh, different types of of issues. Uh, and uh, we have this process, this cybercritographic uh, atlas process that um, uh, some of the key ideas obviously in the interactivity, interacting with the data is important. Um, uh, this idea of multi-sensory and multimedia. So um, often in, in GIS spaces, uh, you don't find multimedia in GIS typically, uh, and you have it for a long time. Uh, it's starting to get more and more common. You're starting to see things like uh, Years ago, when the Google Maps mashups started, and you started to see things like crime maps and people trying to, you know, do more about attaching multimedia to maps. Um, but um, but it's still kind of an ad hoc thing, and it requires you to to um, take all your stuff and, and and push it through, you know, a bit of a soft subtractor to get it to the point where it's, it can be rendered that way. And it doesn't it doesn't work well in the long run if you have existing data sets, existing data getting built. And so we worked a lot on, on sort of reaching right through to the back end um, and try to uh, uh, to get the data from the back, but at the same time making there something very simple on the front end so that uh, the type of users that we're engaging with typically are not um, technical experts in any way. Uh, and they certainly wouldn't be GIS uh, experts, but they, uh, they might be uh, experts on a certain topic. So it might, they might be experts on homelessness and risks of homelessness. They might be experts on trade, but they need something that works for them. Sorry, the question. Yeah. GIS is the geomatic software you use? Uh, GIS is from the term for um, uh, uh, ge geospatial information system. Uh, so it would be, um, you know, like a, uh, Esri makes a product called ArcMap. Uh, you have, uh, you know, uh, various uh, Various things in that space of geomatics. So GIS is sort of uh, systems for holding on to sort of the um, geometries that you might draw. They tend to be very ground focused, so it tends mm -hmm. to be focused on Earth and maps of you know, cities, that kind of thing. You know, municipality might use it to keep track of all of their uh, animal covers, or <laughs> you know, where where are all the pipes going, that kind of stuff. Um, where it's um, uh, and they tend to be very focused on that kind of thing. I mean, obviously. You'll see it anytime you're using Google Maps or something, you're getting a traffic routing, and that's all information from various GIS systems that are feeding that, so all the road networks and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, but they tend to be expert interfaces, so they tend to be for people who've got years of training in using GIS systems, um, and they're complicated, and they tend to be sort of a toolbox as opposed to helping you tell a story. Um, the story winds up being something you have to together. So we're trying to build something that sort of reaches all the way through uh, from the data that might be at sort of raw level, maybe it's coming through sensors, or you've got people in the field collecting data, how do you get it into a point where you can sort of codify the story you're trying to tell all the way through to the visualization of the other end. Um, so that as we get this coming in, you're not having to go in, in the old days, you would go and hire a flash developer to try and build you something that would tell the story for you out of the data and it would be obsolete before it was finished. Right? <laughs> and you'd have to go back and get it recoded again in order to have it um, uh, work for your next 
years data or that kind of thing, right? Um, so we're obviously interested in that. It's also a, it's an open source framework, so uh, it's all up in uh, GitHub. Um, it's uh, openly licensed. Um, we build it as we go, depending on the needs of the people we're working with. So, um, so open to contributions is both from a sort of the design side of things, but also um, obviously it's the open source to having uh, contributions as well. And we really do try and highlight this qualitative and quantitative mix. So we're trying to uh, some of the projects do things like combining weather measurements or sea ice, uh, sea ice thicknesses with an elder's observation of where they've seen a polar bear, for example. And so you can start to get a more holistic picture of what's going on. Um, so this sort of fundamental thing, I think that's uh, uh, maybe of interest to data folks or um, you know, computer science folks is you know, what we're trying to, to highlight here is that when, you're, when your data is going through processing, it takes time, uh, it's expensive in, in time and in other ways, uh, and it, there's a lot of risk because every time you're, you're, you're making a decision about how to process your data or you're, you're going through and you're cleaning something up to get it into sort of a display form, there's a risk that you're breaking it, that you're misrepresenting it. There's a, there's a bunch of, of, of things that happen there. And so if you're doing that in a manual process over a period of months with a team of you know, creative people and computer people and programmers and data people, and um, there's a good chance that that whole process is, um, might have problems with it, and it may not be something that you can repeat easily uh, again if you've discovered that you've got a problem three quarters of the way through. So what we're trying to do um, is get uh, you know the data into a happy place where the data is happy, and <laughs> meaning that it's sort of laid out the way it wants to live. Uh, and then from there, build the steps that, that, that take it from there to sort of a, a rendered final view. And that final view could be for an expert interface, it could be for a public interface, or it could be for a totally different system you build off in the background. But ideally, you're all running off of the same uh, data set. Um, I'll give you a couple of quick examples. I don't know if any of these are going to actually play. Um, But um, uh, something like this is where we started about, what, 12 or 13 years ago now? Yeah. Even longer than that, it's been... 2004, yeah. Yeah. Um, this is uh, maybe one of the first versions of, and, uh, of, of New York, uh, in operation. It was uh, looking at, um, there were two atlases that we produced as uh, sort of proof of concepts. And um, originally, you know, before this, it was things getting made on CD-ROM sort of educational information on CD-ROM or that kind of thing. In order to get interactive experiences back then, you, you, you went to CD-ROM because the web just didn't have it yet. Um, this was you know, 2003, 2004. Um, and um, if you wanted it on the web, it had to be flash. So we weren't really willing to lock into that. Um, proprietary, non-standard, going away. You know, at the time, it wasn't obvious. But, but we went with SVG, which was actually only supported in one bigger version of Firefox at the time, or it was still that was in Firefox and maybe because um, and uh, it turned out to be the right pick. <laughs> but um, what we did is we had a, uh, something where you would compile the, your intents. Uh, you, you, would, you would write XML and it would get compiled into, in this case, a website. Um, but the idea was you could compile it into a CD-ROM if you needed to or into a book. And of course, Web 1, and we didn't, never really focused on CD-ROM or book outputs. And in the end, it became a bit of a clunky system for if all you were doing was Web. Web developers started to come along who could, you know, tinker in JavaScript, and you know, you started to have more, more, um, more capacity there to, to build things. Um, and so we morphed from this type of framework, which was really trying to do what Flash was doing, but uh, using web standards, uh, into a, a more of a JavaScript uh, uh, framework uh, for people to use. So this original version um, had some interesting things, though. Um, in that it was, um, you know, this was a map of territorial claims of Antarctica, uh, but um, this text and the map and the interactive features on the map, the pie slices, were all connected. So if you rolled over these, these would light up. If you, if you rolled over these, this stuff would light up. You would see which country you're talking about. Um, you would have sounds playing as you, as you 
hovered over. If you clicked, you would get more information. But if you hovered, so you could be hovering over different slices of pie, you might hear, for example, three different native speakers of these different countries that have made these claims all talking over top of each other. And that would be a way to illustrate that there's uh, conflict over these claims. You would actually feel the conflict because you have people talking over top of each other. It made people uncomfortable when they used it. No. And that was kind of, that's, I always use this because even though it's very old, um, it's a good example of what um, what we mean by simplifying this stuff down to be able to tell stories with it. And I don't think it would like this is quite common. This is another example from that island of exploring the island of Utopia, which was what people thought Antarctica was. And then you move through the climb and you see various explorers and how they got there, so ships and then on foot when they were actually trekking to set foot on Antarctica and then all the way through the modern mapping machine. And as you go through that sort of timeline across the bottom, you get um, the, this picture of what they thought was down there sort of fades away. So it's a, another storyline on the story that can't uh, show the interaction here. It seemed to work. Center is high risk. Okay. Yeah. So they'll congregate in the center if they're 
risk is high, so you can play with various factors like vacancy rates, number of people spending more than 50% of their income on rent, um, that, that kind of thing. And so if you're, you're, if you're spending more than 50% of your income, if your family is spending more than 50% of your income on rent, then you're at, then you're at higher risk of becoming homeless. It only takes one of you to lose a job. Um, uh, interesting, uh, there was a presentation by uh, one of the courses by a guy from uh, CMHC. Yeah. And he had, uh, they, they were facing, because they, they were using their representations for policy. Yeah. yeah. So he popped up to this slide, a, a, a kind of PowerPoint, he said, well, I'm not supposed to show you this. Yeah. Because he had clearance, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, it's interesting, right? Because this information all exists, but it's all in spreadsheets in organizations that don't know how to use it. Um, you know, they're not technically trained. They're not, you know, they don't have the tools that they need. Um, and it's hard for them to, fund or employ uh, data experts, right? So they need systems that can help them make sense of it on an ongoing basis. Um, something like this where they've got stories about uh, health outcomes. This is the National, uh, this is the Canadian Public Health Association um, looking at uh, creating that. So in this case, they need an actual map of Canada because they're kind of, kind of a political organization, so they want to show their, their breadth. But, um, uh, this, this is interesting how this started because it started as uh, we'd like a uh, we'd like a, a, a map of all of our organizations. We'd like you to find all of their projects, and then from their projects, we want you to find all of their stories. And you know, it took five or six clicks to find anything in this. And then it was like, well, why don't we flip it around? And the data was already in there. It was easy to flip it around and just say, let's put the stories out front. And then if people are interested in the story, they can dig to find the organization. But you know, we had to build it one way first, and then it was you know, flip the switch. And switch it to a different way of working. Um, once the data was in. Uh, domestic abuse, the, something that one of the researchers working on the mapping is sort of like a, almost like a wiki map of uh, people who put stuff that's uh, disturbing to them that they don't want on their wall anymore. But you know, one of these things in domestic abuse is you don't necessarily want the relationships to end. You want the, you want the, the abuse to end. Um, and so there's a lot of mixed memories. And this is a bit of a scrapbooking site for people to put, um, put that kind of stuff. They don't necessarily want it around them, around them all the time anymore, but they don't want to lose it. Um, language mapping. Now, this is uh, an area that's starting to take off and use of newly in sort of language mapping, and in particular, uh, the ability to sort of um, uh, cross reference languages <coughs> with uh, different ways of organizing taxonomies of languages. Um, there are a lot of people in computation doing like computational linguistics to try and like analyze languages and stuff. Um, there's not a lot of people working on the, on the the mapping side on the uh, the, the um, uh, connections and one between languages and what people are perceiving. So the human end of like, linguistics doesn't doesn't have a lot of technical capacity. Um, and we're fine. And we're doing things like this, where you know, this is a map of one province in Iran, uh, and those are all settlements, like down to four people settlements. Uh, so so this was obtained from the Iranian uh, Stats Bureau, uh, but they would not release any of the coordinates of the locations of database for. Um, and so they've actually got, you know, there's a team of about 40 people on the ground who are mapping out all of these settlements and, and indicating which sort of languages are spoken there. And then um, it moves, the, actually in that one it moves to um, being able to create, um, have people create their own taxonomy. So you may feel that your language is closer to another language and some linguists may disagree and then you've got Eastern and Western linguists have very different ways of looking at languages, and so they're trying to really capture the whole picture. There's some 400 language varieties spoken in Iran, um, and some everything from uh, you know the, the, the Persian and Arabic uh, families, uh, as well as things like Swahili, and you know there's, there's all kinds of stuff there. Um, I'm just going to bomb through some of these examples. This is um, uh, social entrepreneurship in Montreal. There's a group working on that. And sort of map out this uh, innovation, Cartier d'Innovation in Montreal. Um, this is a map we did of, um, for the Ontario uh, Brain Institute. And this is, uh, this, if you're familiar with JavaScript libraries, this is uh, using D3, uh, but we've ingested the ability to use D3 Unity. So D3 is sort of doing some of the, the rendering stuff, but it's all connected into the Unity uh, data models and uh, events and all of that. Um, so now it's, that was a fair bit of work to get that in, but now it's reusable uh, with new projects by, you know, with the new link, just saying, okay, I'd like to create a new custom canvas, and then off you go and you sort of write your code, but you can, you can pull the data straight up. Um, and 
and this one is showing individuals connected through various research projects. So once the database is full of you know, who's working on what and where, um, then you can start to do representations of this system in play. So, um, and then you can modify it so for things like adding different types of things to this. So this one's focused on organizations and how they're connected to various projects. And that sort of thing. We also do a lot of mapping with uh, indigenous communities. Uh, particularly in the north, but elsewhere as well. Uh, and um, we look, we're looking at things like um, uh, different representations of data that uh, is more conducive to the way that uh, communities want to see the data map. Um, uh, issues that, uh, you know, aren't, aren't being <laughs> mapped elsewhere, like uh, where are all the residential schools? Where were they? What, um, what years were they in operation? What were they called at particular times? Um, and giving people a place to go and uh, comment and attach stories, or uh, um, you know, so survivors can, can look up um, you know particular schools and particular day ranges, that sort of thing. Um, were there residential schools in the states as well? Yeah. Oh, you could. Yeah. yeah. That was a big. Uh, thing. There's only a uh, hundred and some that were part of this recent settlement. Um, uh, place name mapping is an interesting one because uh, you have something like an Inuit language where oral tradition, oral, oral representation of the name is the authoritative version of written is really a construct that came later. Um, and so having talking maps that, that where the talking is the priority um, and the spelling is something that's still up for debate and there's people sort of <laughs> trying to narrow down and standardize the writing system still. There's 13 different sort of writing systems dialect writing system combinations right now in, 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 uh, for, for Inuit. So um, some of that standardization product is part of actually another project we're working on. But, um, but being able to have an elder talk about a place, the meaning of the place, of course, all the meanings are tied to words. So being able to attach audio, attach video, this atlas, you can go and put up uh, photospheres uh, and, uh, and go and you know, view and interact with the place. Um, and these were all built because of requests coming something your typical sort of mapping system can do, but but uh, we try to build it as, as we need it. So talking maps of so, uh, being able to include more place and location information. Sorry, the video is not play there. Um, some of the stuff we had to do, of course, they, they, they had to do a lot of work to try and make it fit into GIS systems so they could get some of their place names recognized officially by things like, in this case, it's the Wichita and Northwest Territory. So Northwest Territory is required to be extremely detailed with their polygons. Um, of course, that doesn't translate well to the You can sort of have interactivity on the web or complex features on the web, but not necessarily both. The SVG rendering for these things was, was difficult. So writing a bunch of stuff to do um, was essentially a, a vector simplification and pyramiding on the fly so that the, the database is storing multiple versions of these vectors and feeding them to you depending on which levels you're at and stuff. That was an interesting problem that was actually, I don't think anybody else has done that. Um, it's, been, it's been done on uh, in raster imagery, like Google Earth, you know, as you zoom in, you get new tiles and stuff of raster, but on, ve on the vector simplification as you go, we haven't seen that before. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Things like sea ice maps, uh, this, is the, this is the travel routes and locations and things that people know from three different communities. You can probably figure out where the three communities are. It's about an island. Um, if you zoom right in, you start to see sort of the breadth of knowledge and how do you make sense of that. Um, and one way that, that uh, Inuit like to narrow things down is by, um, you know, who, who provided it. So you, in this case, you know, we want to be able to show that it's a particular person's um, uh, trails, routes, knowledge. Um, and, they were and that knowledge was provided through a series of interviews or workshops. And so the people are really important. In sort of these data systems, typically, and we'll, the question we get asked all the time by people like uh, the, you know, the government and stuff is, well, uh, uh, how accurate are those lines? Um, <laughs> they were drawn with a marker on a paper map and digitized, and like they're not accurate, um, they're authentic. And that, that's a, there's a difference there. And that's some, the difference that you know, all the science stuff is designed around all these numbers and want to quantify how accurate these lines are. The reality is that when you take it to people, North, they want to know who provided it. Who drew that line? Oh, it's Joanna C. Okay, yeah. He's going to follow his line. 
Um, Eric, uh, you know, he's lost three snowmobiles, you know, out there in the last two years. So yeah, we're not following his line across the ice. Thank you very much. You know, that's that's more important. <laughs> And so being able to hear the elders talk and tell those stories is really important contextual information. Likewise, mapping out sea ice terminology. So for example, you've heard there's a lot of words for in, in, in aptitude for, uh, for snow or ice. And this is all, uh, these are all words for ice at different phases of the freeze-thaw cycle. So what we're looking at here is a map of a, a freeze-thaw cycle, not a no specific land map. This freeze-thaw cycle is specific to the community of Cape Dorset, and these words are specific to the community of Cape Dorset. Um, Many of them will be also used in other communities. The cycle may or may not look similar. It kind of depends on the geography of Cape Dorset versus the geography of somewhere else, and what type of ice they get, how the wind blows, what kind of weather events they have, when things freeze and thaw, that kind of thing. So you will see different phenomena in different communities. Um, so working with this kind of visualization of, of, of data um, is interesting. And we're moving to this to be able for them to come and add things to this and, 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 and edit it on the fly. I go through some of these, you know, uh, looking at um, repatriation of uh, sort of digital return of stuff. So this is a project we're working with the Museum of Denmark uh, and the community of uh, uh, Cambridge Bay, the Cape Bay Society, uh, around returning uh, stuff from the uh, Rasmussen expeditions up north. So they so they're very appreciative that the museum has had all this stuff. It was sort of fairly traded for and all of that stuff at the time. The museum has kept it all in good shape. They've got all kinds of artifacts, photos, records, um, and they've got reports. What's missing is the Inuit side of that story. So there were Inuit who traveled with them, there were Inuit who saw them, who came, they all had stories. There are many, there are many offspring that have Rasmussen as, uh, in, their, in their lineage now, because <laughs> he was uh, 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 an explorer. An explorer, <laughs> yeah. yes. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> fertile explorer. Um, anyway, and so there's a lot of stories there to, to, uh, to tease out, and so we're trying to present an interface that allows put their story alongside the, the Rasmussen story. Um, language mapping and, uh, and you know, language mapping starts with things like this. Um, and, uh, you know, to try and make it a, a educational, it turns into stuff like this, but there's also uh, language maps where you can sort of see across the Arctic how you might say different, different words. And in this case, they're starting with body parts, but you know, the plan is to get the entire um, lexicon uh, created. Um, inventory of, of, of marine use and uh, species observations and stuff. This is a huge uh, undertaking the government of Nunavut where we're working to sort of make sense of this for them. They've, they've got all kinds of data that's been coming back on different maps. They've been scanning them and getting into the sort of book format and sending them out in book format. Um, but there's no, there's no comprehensive database of this. It's all kind of you know, produce the book and, and, and put the rest of that in a file cabinet. So we're now trying to get it to the point where it's an active data set and online and available for people and being used by other people. This is the kind of work that happens um, when we're trying to make that switch from things like you know drawing on paper and the, the, you know the six months to two year process of somebody drawing and making notes on a piece of paper to getting it into a system like that. Um, with all kinds of mistakes and, and omissions along the way, you're missing half the story uh, to the point where you could have sort of an L, a youth from the, from the community working the elders of the community to document their own knowledge and use the system that way. Um, and that's happening more and more now. Um, kids are getting into it, so I'm recording the stuff and putting things in. Of course, the, the heavy B oral maps is heavy. Um, working on a hat, um, an app. So we've, we've had an app for the, the used on the iPad, and it's been used out in the field, it's been tested to allow people to collect information offline, take the database with them offline, work offline with people. To of the places and that kind of thing, and then come back and hit a button and sync it up, and then it all shows up in the atlas. Um, it worked quite well, uh, but uh, you know, Apple's pain in the butt, so um, we're now in the process of rebuilding that for, uh, for Android. Um, so if there's any interest in Android, you know, like that's now. Um, but um, Android, we can do things like save things to memory cards before you drop it in the ice flow, for example. Um, and we're working on things like uh, trying to build uh, those, you know, tables, right? So instead of rolling out paper on the table, how do you get to the point where you have a table? How do you make it easier for people so an elder to come and interact with it? So in this case, you know, we're talking about a tangible object being recognized by the table. 
um, you can turn it into a, a little sculpture of a seal and stamp it across where you've seen seal or that kind of thing. So we're doing some experiments with that. This is a, a reactable. It's an, actually it was a design and built, and it's, still, it's sold as a, as a musical instrument for, for DJs and, and sort of electronic musicians. Um, but it collapses to carry it in a gig bag, so it was good for traveling up north with it. Um, projector based, though. Um, this is a, a museum sort of interactive touch table. It's actually more of a touch surface, like a giant, uh, like a giant uh, screen, a tablet screen sort of uh, functionality, so much more precise. It's going to help us figure out a lot of the user interface without fussing with the other table that had trouble, you know, finger recognition and stuff. It was a infrared camera based thing. Um, and we've already um, started to, you know, show this to our collaborators who are pretty excited by it. This, this type of thing is what they'd like to now have in their, in their community centers as they're, um, what is now being done with the knowledge banks. So having communities have their own knowledge banks and start to work with them, have to be easy enough to use for them to store and manage their own information. And when they want to provide information to a visiting scientist, the scientists can be the ones that license the information from the community rather than asking them to sign an agreement to give them all the data all the time. It's kind of changing the power dynamic. So I'm sure you're interested in knowing what this looks like. We're, we're using a document-oriented database in the back end for new to reach out to other things, but we're using CouchDB. Um, we were, the early uh, new lead was based on, the, on the relational databases, and we just kept having to rewrite a lot of code every time we hit a different type of application, be a different layout, a different requirement to organize things. And you, you, you know, relational databases work great when you really know what you've got and you know what you're going to be getting. Don't know what you've got or what you're going to be getting, and or it's changing frequently. Um, then they don't really work very well for for, for developing. You know, it's, um, it can be a lot of work to manage. So instead, we'll get something like a document oriented database, and then the classic GIS type system. This might be a row and a table where you've got a polygon and you've got some attributes about the polygon. In our case, we try and break the attributes out into another document potentially. Don't have doesn't have to be, but we have that flexibility. So in the case of Things like, for example, even place names, if you have a, a place that has more than one name, um, well, how many more of them am I going to have? In a relational database, I, you know, I have to either organize that or I have multiple columns. In a GIS, they don't even do relational, so they, you would wind up with this whole bunch of columns, you know, name one, name two, name three. Oh, what about name four? Oh, we can account for that. Right? Um, whereas this way, we just make multiple, multiple iterations and we connect them. So that polygon could have multiple name representations. The name could be pointing to multiple polygons. Um, we don't care about things like whether it's a polygon, a line, or a point, whereas classic GIS systems are very hard coded back in early days of, <laughs> of computer GIS. I mean, it was a line, it was a point, it was a polygon, and they shouldn't mix. Um, and so we started to break away from that. Uh, things you might not expect in your um, relational database for GIS would be a rap video, for example. Um, and so when a community comes and the youth in the community want to put a rap video into their map, um, then you need to be able to accommodate it. So we start to build out these documents and we have this concept of schemas where we know, for example, that we're going to have media, we're going to have place names, we're going to have genomes, we're going to have people, we're going to have uh, interviews. And so we can start to say, well, what, what kinds of things would each of these have? And it's kind of like doing your table design in your, in your relational database, uh, except that it's much more flexible because these documents will live whether the structure changes or not. Um, so you can you can keep sort of growing it, changing it, finding what you need, and adding it on. Um, you know, you might need a note. The note is about this interview, and so you start to link things up. And then somebody comes and draws something you didn't expect, like a golf course, and okay, the nine-hole golf course in Arctic Bay, on top of Baffin Island. It's like you know nine tin cans buried in the tundra. Willie's golf course. So Willie's golf course, um, you know, is uh, it, it's not really a place name in the way that you were collecting place names before a traditional place name. Uh, but they put it in because you know we, we can we can accommodate it. Um, but later you might decide that you know there's a, an extra attribute that you need here, and you don't want to have to keep track of the number of holes on every place name. You know if this had been in a normal database, I would have kind of gone to that table and say, well, where am I putting the number of holes, and how am I connecting that up, and all this. In this case, we can just tack that attribute on. And in fact, you might decide that it's not. Um, no, it's not, it's not a meaning to create, or I need to change that attribute. So I can go and change the equivalent would be changing your column name, but only having to apply to one row, 
right, at a table, or having to go and do a bunch of work to do something else, and that requires touching a whole bunch of code. And in this case, you can, you can do it on just these ones. And then eventually you decide that actually I'm going to have a scheme for golf courses because it seems to be a popular thing. People will build golf courses. Um, and so now I have a new type of document, but I didn't have to change anything else. I didn't have to touch anything else. Everything continued to work while I put in a golf course and while I made a change to it. So it's a, sort of a fundamental difference in the way of thinking about data management. Uh, it's got its drawbacks. You have to learn how to work without SQL, for example. <laughs> so querying these things and writing reports and that kind of stuff. You when we're writing things in JavaScript. You've got to write JavaScript to go and fetch and do great reports and that kind of stuff. Um, so in some ways, it's nicer for programmers. Um, uh, but it doesn't have the same kind of uh, you know, robust support out there for tools and that kind of thing. Uh, what does this look like? So we have this idea of a module document that sort of defines what kind of stuff you're going to show at any given time, what kind of maps we use, how you style it, what kinds of data are you connecting. Uh, you've got a schema document which defines the schema. So how do I show it? How do I show it? What would the form look like if I was adding a new one of these? Um, and so it's all it's all JSON based. So CouchDB is all uh, um, so JSON is the JavaScript object location, and so it's all it's all based on that, uh, or just stored in that format. Um, but it's uh, so these things are sort of broken apart, and then you have things you know some of the, the, the bits around uh, you know, navigation. And there's CSS and there's some custom JS. So we do a bunch of stuff out of the box, but anything you need to do yourself. Customize. You need to change how something works. You can override pretty much everything. You can use bits and pieces of it. You don't even have to deploy the whole thing as a system, right? You can use the libraries in your own system. Um, and nice thing, the other nice thing about document-oriented databases, and one of the reasons we switched to it, uh, apart from the flexibility, which is a big one, was this idea of replication. And so we had this issue where, you know, to get to this point, we had community knowledge banks, but these community knowledge banks live on the other end crappy satellite internet connection. Uh, and so if they want to have the knowledge bank and they want to possess the information, they want to they want to own it. <laughs> um, that's great.